Now believe me, I know if you've been taught evolution and you believed it, this is going to sound really strange to you. But if you believe the Bible is true, it's not a problem, folks. The world's about 6,000 years old. God made everything in six days just like He said He did. And there could be a few dinosaurs still alive because they've certainly lived with man all through history. We'll start up where we left off in the last section. Job chapter 40 says, Behemoth lives in the fens. Now, fens is an old English word that means the swamp. The largest swamp in the world is in the middle of Africa. Most Americans don't know how big Africa is, so here's what Africa looks like next to America. It is gigantic. That swamp in the middle there is bigger than any one of those yellow states. It is the same size as each of the red states. Can you imagine a swamp the size of Florida, the entire state, 55,000 square miles? The Congo government says the swamp is 80% unexplored. Congo was colonized by Belgium in 1885, and then it was liberated by the communists in 1960. You know how the communists liberate countries. They killed everybody and said, okay, you're free now. But, um, <laughs> oh, what a bloodbath that was. Anyway, explorers began to go into that swamp in the 1700s and 1800s and reported there are dinosaurs still alive. In 1910, this article appeared in the New York newspaper, Dinosaurs Still Alive. Now, they called it a brontosaurus. Later, they found out it wasn't, you know, they had the wrong head on the skeleton at the museum. That's another long story. But is a brontosaurus still roaming Africa's wilds in 1910? In 1948, this article appeared in the Saturday Evening Post. Dinosaurs are still alive. A game hunter returned from a trip to Angola and announced to the Cape Town newspaper, the Cape Argus, that there was an animal of large dimensions, the description of which could only fit a dinosaur, dwelling in the Dololo swamps and known to the natives as the Chippequee. It has the head and tail of a lizard. The Azandi people in Central African Republic call it Nuguru, Nuguri, different, different tribal names for this creature. In 1980, Roy Mackle from the University of Chicago went to the swamp in Africa. He read all these reports of dinosaurs still alive and said, hey, let's go check it out. Now, Roy Mackle, he's retired now, but he was an evolutionist and he was a microbiologist and an interesting fella. He likes to check out what is the truth. He went to the swamp, spent six weeks. He went back to the swamp the next year and spent a quarter of a million dollars on the expedition. He came out after those two trips and wrote this book, A Living Dinosaur, by Roy Mackle, University of Chicago. He said in the swamp, the natives kept talking about an animal called Mahamba. And he said, what is a Mahamba? When they showed him pictures of different animals, they picked out the crocodile and said, that's Mahamba. He gets 50 feet long. Now, if you're a pygmy four foot four, he looks real big from your perspective, right? And he kept hearing them talk about an animal called Mokile Mbembe. Mokile Mbembe. He said, what on earth is that? They would take a stick and draw on the ground a picture of an apatosaurus or a cetosaurus. And when he went to a different village, he would try to confuse them. He would show them the picture of a cetosaurus and say, what is this? They'd say, oh, Mokile Mbembe. So in some villages, he asked them what, what Mokile Mbembe was, and they drew the picture. Other villages, he showed them the picture, and they told him the name. He couldn't get them confused, which means they're not just making up a story. This animal, the natives say, is about the size of a hippopotamus. It's uh, got a long neck and a long tail. It lives under water. Its favorite food is uh, the malombo plant. Here's Dr. Mackle holding a malombo plant. They found footprints of the creatures on the shore. And they said the animals will come out of the water once in a while and eat plants along the side of the river. A missionary friend of mine, Eugene Thomas, there's his phone number in Ohio. He's retired now, but he spent 42 years in the swamp in Africa. He said there were two pygmies that he knew that came to his church that killed and ate one of those dinosaurs. Hmm. The Mokile Mbembe, I believe, means stopper of rivers. They say he's so big he'll get across the creeks and completely stop them from flowing. Marcelina Agnagna is a biologist from the Congo. He's a communist and an evolutionist. He says, look, I've seen one of those animals in the swamp. See, the people that live in the major cities there in Congo, they don't go into the swamp. Hardly anybody goes into the swamp. Why would you, right? Good place to get ate up by mosquitoes. Dr. Mark Miller went in there and just about got killed by the pygmies because the pygmies have been told, if you ever see a white man, he's probably a spy and you need to shoot him and kill him. So it's just not a very safe place to go, but you might want to get World Explorer uh, 
magazine and read the articles about folks that have gone into the swamp. Uh, Herman Ragusters and his wife Kia went into the swamp. They live in Los Angeles. He came back with a tape recording of the voice of this Mokele Mbembe roaring. Strangest sound I've ever heard. I've got a copy of the tape at home. But they said the creature was dark brown in color. The skin appeared slick and smooth with a long neck and a small head. Herman saw it, Kia saw it, and they heard it on several occasions. And they heard it making a tremendous roar. He said, many other members of the expedition, and this includes government officials from the Republic of Congo, saw it and heard it. Here's an article from uh, Boston Herald newspaper, 1999, June 29th, talking about the expedition into the Congo swamp to try to capture one of these dinosaurs. There have been many expeditions, about 30 expeditions now, into the swamp. The natives will tell you these animals live in caves, and they're very rarely seen. They're more active at night. William Gibbons is a friend of mine. He and I wrote this book together, Claws, Jaws, and Dinosaurs. He's been to the swamp three times. Uh, he's going back again spring of 2001. There have been probably, I don't know, 30 expeditions into that swamp to try to capture or to at least photograph one of these things. Cal Bombay is a friend of mine from uh, 100 Huntley Street in a Canadian TV program. He's a, he was a missionary in Kenya for 15 years. <clears throat> he and his wife said they saw one of these and watched it for 15 minutes. But he said the plates on the back were bigger. That's what he told me. In South America, there are stories from the Amazon jungle. Colonel Fawcett from 1907 went down there. He was known as a meticulous recorder of facts. He went into the swamp there to find the boundary between Brazil and Peru. He was an officer in the Royal Engineers. Colonel Fawcett reported that he saw an animal that he believed to be the Diplodocus. The Diplodocus story is confirmed by many of the tribes east of the Yucayali River. Hmm. Colonel Fawcett's son Brian do, drew these pictures of the animal's footprints that they found in the swamp down there in South America. In 1883, this article appeared in Scientific American. Here I'll quote. <clears throat> the Brazilian minister at La Paz, Bolivia, has remitted to the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Rio photographs of drawings of an extraordinary saurian dinosaur, sauropod, okay, killed on the Benny after receiving 36 balls. They shot it 36 times to kill it. By order of the president of Bolivia, the dried body, which had been preserved in Asuncion, was sent to La Paz. It was 12 meters, that's 39 feet long, from snout to the point of the tail, which latter is flattened. Besides the anterior head, it has four meters behind, two small but completely formed heads, question mark. They don't know what they were, some kind of bumps, rising from the back. All three have much resemblance to the head of a dog. The legs are short and end in formidable claws. The legs, belly, and lower part of the throat appear defended by a kind of scale armor. And all the back is protected by still thicker and durable cuirass. I don't know what that is. Uh, I think a layer of thick skin or scales. Um, starting from behind the ears of the anterior head and continuing to the tail. The neck is long, the belly large, and almost dragging on the ground. Professor Gilvetti, who examined the beast, thinks it is not a monster, but a member of a rare and almost lost species, as the Indians in some parts of Bolivia use small earthen vases of identical shape and probably copied from nature. Hmm. Here's a picture of a snake in the back of a truck. The snake is 35 feet long and has a native inside. Colonel Fawcett shot and killed a 62-foot anaconda snake. The natives that were with him said, Colonel, you should see the big ones. You mean they get bigger than that? Oh, yes, sir. Officials of the brazil Colombia Boundary Commission, 1933, killed a 98-foot snake, two feet in diameter, with a machine gun. Uh, the people had the machine gun, not the snake, okay? <clears throat> <laughs> On the banks of the Rio Negro, it weighed two tons. Four men had been unable to lift its head. The cook from the hotel in Amazon jungle saw a 100-foot snake the military had hunted down and killed after it had eaten two soldiers. A 130-foot-long snake was reported by Reuters News Service in 1977. This snake drifted down the Amazon in 1948. Nobody poked it to see if it was alive, but they say it would have been about 150 feet long to just let that one drift on by. See, the Amazon is a giant river. One of my former students was down there as a missionary for a while. He was way up in the middle of the country. He said, Brother Hoven, where we live, the Amazon is only nine miles wide. 
Can you imagine a river nine miles wide? <laughs> How many things can hide in a river like that? Many people have probably heard of a lake in Scotland called Loch Ness. You ever heard of Loch Ness before? Loch Ness is a long, skinny lake. It's about a mile and a half wide and uh, 24 miles long. It's extremely deep, being in between two mountain ranges. It gets nearly 1,000 feet deep in places. There's a map of Loch Ness on the table down here in front of me. This map is from Scotland. They say Loch Ness is big enough that everybody in the world could go drowned in it at the same time. It would hold the entire population of the planet in that lake. That's how much volume it has. In 1933, a road was put in along the edge of Loch Ness. Now before that time, if you wanted to see Loch Ness, you had to take a boat up river seven miles from the town of Inverness, or you had to climb over the mountains to get there. But in 1933, they put a roadbed, cut a groove into the mountains and put a, a roadbed along the edge. Right away, people began reporting a creature in the lake that later became known as the Loch Ness Monster. In 1933, the first year the road was put in, there were 52 separate sightings of the Loch Ness Monster. This author said there have been 9,000 reported sightings. That was back in the 60s. Now it's over 11,000. 11,000 people claim they've seen this creature. Now some of the sightings are no doubt hoaxes and frauds, okay? But that doesn't mean all 11,000 are. Sir Peter Scott, a member of Parliament, says, I've seen the Loch Ness Monster. He said, I think it's a plesiosaurus. Plesiosaur, long neck and four flippers. Most people that see it claim it is a plesiosaur, but look what this fellow says in the book here. Others insist Nessie must be a plesiosaur. One thing wrong with this theory is that plesiosaurs are believed to have become extinct 70 million years ago. Well, that's nothing wrong with the theory. That's something wrong with what you've been taught. Most people claim it is a plesiosaurus, four flippers, long skinny neck, environment. Walmart or Toys R Us, okay? Arthur Grant is a veterinarian student. He nearly ran into Nessie on his motorcycle one night. He was crossing the road in front of him. Now the guy's a veterinary medicine student. He ought to know something about animals. Arthur drew this sketch. said, folks, that's what Nessie looks like right there. Hmm. Alexander Campbell was the game warden for Loch Ness for 47 years. He said, I've seen Nessie 18 times. It looks like that a sketch that he drew of the Loch Ness Monster. People have built cages, they've baited it with everything you can imagine and th some things you can't imagine trying to catch the Loch Ness Monster. Many folks have drawn sketches of it. Some people say, well, if, why didn't somebody get a good picture? Well, that's a fair question. How many of you have ever seen a car accident? I mean, you watched it happen. <clears throat> you ever seen one? Let me see you get a picture of one as it happens. Even if the camera is sitting there beside you, ready to fire, you won't think of it until it's too late. It'll be, bam, oh man, I should have got a picture. I had a camera right there. <laughs> I don't think you'll be able to get one. It'd be pretty tough, okay? But many folks claim they've seen this monster. Some have gotten pictures, a little fuzzy, or long distance, or even movie films. But the Spicer family said it had a sheep in its mouth when it crossed the road in front of their car. One guy did get a picture of its back sticking out of the water. And on the right, you can see the neck sticking up. Now, when this photograph was put in Reader's Digest, Mysteries of the Unexplained, they cut the head off. There's what you get from Reader's Digest. All you see is the back. You know, the shortened version, Reader's Digest, of course. Okay. Torquil McLeod lives on Loch Ness. He says, I saw a Loch Ness monster, and he drew these sketches as he watched it through his binoculars. He said it was on the shore on the other side of the lake, and its head was moving back and forth like a snake trying to strike something. After watching it for nine minutes, he drew that sketch. He said, folks, that's what Nessie looks like. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Greta Findlay saw it and drew that sketch. Some people report horns on it. Other people say there are no horns. I don't know. Maybe there's a male and a female. Maybe there's a retractable breathing tube. Nobody has a clue what it is for sure, but there's lots of theories out there. World Book Encyclopedia put a submarine over there. They, re they rented the submarine from a guy in America here, took it over and dropped it into Loch Ness. The guy went down in the sub. He said, man, that water is so black, I can't even see the front of my own boat, and I'm in it. He reported in the Knoxville newspaper. By the way, he's got a website, nessaproject.com. Dan Taylor of Hardyville, South Carolina, built this mini sub. He said, Nessie is pretty elusive. I thought I got her. Something was lying on the bottom, and the wash from it threw my submarine way off course. The Japanese put 24 boats in the lake and scanned the entire bottom of Loch Ness with sonar. I'm sure Nessie heard 24 boats coming down the lake, okay? 
But they said there were large objects down there, 300 feet down, but they could not tell what they were. They did get the first map of the bottom of Loch Ness. They said Loch Ness, the bottom of it, is wrinkled up like a raisin. There are lots of places to hide. Some have reported there are caves going up into the mountains out of Loch Ness. Maybe there are air chambers. Nessie can go up and stay in a cave in, above water inside the mountain and exit in and out when they want, like a beaver does, okay? I don't know, just a theory. But the uh, Academy of Applied Science put underwater cameras down, hooked up to sonar devices, and left them there. If anything swims past, it'll trigger the camera to flash pictures. One of the pictures they got shows a diamond-shaped flipper. Hmm. Maybe it's a plesiosaur. Most folks think that it is. Reader's Digest showed this picture of a plesiosaur or Nessie with its mouth open. Most of the pictures in indicate some kind of hump on the back. Some people say, I, heard, I read one testimony where they said there were three humps. And all of a sudden when it took off to swim, the hump straightened out into one big curve. So maybe they're just simply muscular contractions. I, I don't know. Again, there are lots of theories on the subject. But most of the sketches or pictures indicate something like a plesiosaur. They claim the surgeon's photo was a fake, and it certainly could be, I don't know. But it sure is interesting, they waited till the last guy died to announce it's a fake. The last guy involved died, and they said, on his deathbed, he said it was a fake. Well, there's no way to verify any stories about it now that I know of. But uh, Loch Ness is not the only lake. There are seven other lakes in Scotland reporting monster sightings, similar to Loch Ness. The Cornish sea serpent has been seen by folks. Here, these two pictures show the neck in different positions, showing some movement. Hmm. Down in the English Channel, people have reported a sea monster, <coughs> similar to Nessie. In a dictionary, we think it's a 1766 dictionary. The cover was gone when I got it. But on page 995, it talks about sea dragons. Here's what it says. A marine monster caught in England in 1749, resembling in some degree an alligator but having two large fins which served for swimming or flying. It had two legs terminating in hoofs like those of an ass. Its body is covered with impenetrable scales. It had five rows of teeth. Whatever that was, I don't know. This thing washed up on the beach in Normandy, France. It's in Time Magazine, the March of, 90, of 1934. The 25-foot creature washed up on the beach in France. Two professors from Paris Natural History Museum analyzed the creature and said it was definitely not a whale, not a sea cow. It is possible we are in the presence of an unknown species, they said. There's a man standing there for scale, looking at this thing. This little critter swam past a boatload of scientists in Brazil in 1905. They said it had a dorsal fin, six feet long and two feet high, and a small head, and a neck seven or eight feet long in front of the fin. They turned in their uh, report in 1905, so we don't know what it is, but there's a brand new creature out there by Brazil. Down in New Zealand in 1977, Japanese fishing boat pulled this up out of the water in their net. It was 900 feet down, it weighed 4,000 pounds, it was 32 feet long, and it stunk terribly. It had been dead for a while. When they set it down on the deck, white pus oozed out everywhere. So they took a bunch of photographs of it, <clears throat> got a few samples of tissue, and threw it back. But they made a sketch of the bones, the marine biologist on board did. They made a special stamp for Japanese mail, 1977. There's one of the stamps on the yellow poster down here. You can come see that later. Now, some of the modern uh, American scientists have said it was just a shark. And so when they analyzed the cartilage that they took, the protein, they said it's 96% similar to shark, cart shark protein. I said, okay, so what? They said, see, that proves it's a shark. <laughs> no, it doesn't. First place, who's ever seen plesiosaur protein to know what it's supposed to look like? Hmm. Secondly, 96% or whatever it is, is a 4% difference. That's a lot of difference. Humans and chimps are 98% similar, but they're very different animals. So I don't go along with that shark. Uh, the people who had it with them in their boat said, look, we think it's a dinosaur, a plesiosaur. So of course the people who never touched it said, we think it's a shark, and they always call it a basking shark. That's their standard answer from the skeptics. This uh, article was written in a <coughs> newspaper. It's called Mystery of the Lake in Russia where a creature was seen with a fin on its back and a long, skinny neck. What looked like a huge dinosaur washed up on the beach in Russia after a storm in 1994. The carcass was 39 feet long. In Japan, <clears throat> on the North Island, there's reports of a creature there that appears to be some kind of uh, sea monster or lake, lake monster. 
There's one in Lake Ikeda, Japan, which is southern island of Japan, actually western island, and they say they've got a creature there called Issy, similar to Loch Ness Monster. China has one in a lake over there. They say it's a USO, unidentified swimming object. What would you call it? The monster was golden yellow in color, had a long neck, bearded, of course Chinese, has to have a beard, and a horned head the size of a wash basin. Hmm. In Sweden, there's been something seen in this lake up there in Sweden. 450 people claim they've seen it in this lake in Sweden. Canada has bunches of lake monsters. About 20 different lakes are reporting creatures like the Loch Ness Monster. This article uh, talks about Nessie's Canadian cousin from the New York Times. It lives in British Columbia. It's called the Ogopogo. There's a huge lake there called Lake Okanagan, which is 80 miles long. Big lake and very deep, okay? Ogopogo, there was a book we sold. They're out of print now. We're hoping they bring it back into print, but as of now, they're, they're not available. But it's an interesting book about the Ogopogo. This article says uh, right here, they were the latest among thousands to see something strange in this narrow 80-mile long lake. Thousands claim they've seen the Ogopogo. I interviewed this man on top. His name is Keith Ross. These four guys were fishing in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Cape Sable Island, Canada. Nova Scotia. Here's the story he told me. I interviewed him in 1992. I met with him. He was 67 at the time. He said, Mr. Oban, I've been fishing out there since I was five. The whole village is a fishing village. I preached up there on that island. He said the creature was 40 to 50 feet long and it chased their boat for one to two miles. He wasn't sure how long. You don't pay attention to those things when you're running from a creature. He said its head was out of the water 15 feet, which means it's not a fish because they have to go underwater to breathe. He said it had a wide mouth and four-foot tusks like a walrus, as well as other pointed sharp teeth about the size of his finger. I showed him a plesiosaur model, like this one. He said, no, it's not exactly like that. He said the neck was thicker and shorter, eight or nine foot neck, two foot diameter. He said it had nine inch diameter eyes, and the eyes had yellow red circles around them, and they were set at an angle from the front, not on the side like a fish. He could see no visible means of propulsion as it swam toward them. It was gray-brown, covered in barnacles, rough textured, and did not appear to have scales. They were six miles south of Cape Sable Island, Nova Scotia. The water was 180 feet deep and flat calm. He said, I don't want to see it again. We've got a book we sell called Cadborosaurus, about the one seen in Cadborough Bay, British Columbia, just north of Seattle, Washington. Professor LeBlond and a couple other guys have been collecting articles about this and interviewing folks who've seen it. They say this creature's been seen as far south as Oregon. It has a long neck, short pointed front flippers, and a horse-like head. A couple of pilots saw one at Sanish Inlet, according to Carl Schuker, who wrote the book called The Unexplained. A guy was out there with his sailboat one time, and a little one swam past him. So he put his dip net down and picked it up, put it in a bucket, and drew this sketch of it. He said it was scratching the bucket trying to get out, and the guy felt kind of bad, so he dumped it overboard. Didn't keep it. This book called Monster Monster, we sell through our ministry, you can get that, <clears throat> about North American lake monsters. I spent three hours interviewing this man. His name is Jacques Boivet, a Canadian fella. He lives in Magog, Quebec, just north of Vermont. He's been spending years collecting information about the Lake Memphremagog monster. Just in one year, 92, there were 26 separate people who saw the Lake Memphremagog monster. I mean, this is doctors, engineers, corporate vice presidents, there's been something seen in the Potomac River. They say Chesapeake Chessy resembles the Loch Ness Monster. There's an island south of Rhode Island called Block Island right there. On 1996, this critter washed up on the beach. They called it, of course, the Block Ness Monster. And somebody stole the bones. We don't know where it is. In Lake Erie, something's been seen in Lake Erie for many years. There's articles in the paper all the time about it. Erie's Bessie matches Nessie. They describe it as 35 feet long with a snake-like head. Just in 1990, there were five people who saw it on three separate occasions. Comes out in the newspaper occasionally. Uh, here, on Oregon, here on Ohio Associated Press article, <clears throat> says the serpent-like creature makes Lake Erie its home. A boat captain saw it. He said it moved up and down, not side to side like a snake, kind of humping itself through the water. Interesting. I interviewed John Kraft. He saw the Lake, Lake Erie monster in 1991, and he photographed it. 
He said, Mr. Hovind, the head was sticking out of the water, but by the time I got my camera set up, the head was down, all I got was the back. Sorry about that. That's the best picture I can get for you. Pete Peterson is a taxidermist and runs a bait shop there in, on Lake Erie. He was uh, walking along the beach one day and he saw a strange little animal laying there. Seagulls were picking at it. He brought it back and stuffed it and mounted it. He's a taxidermist. There it is. He said, I don't know what it is. You got any idea? Boy, not me. Carl Ball bought it. It's down in Texas now in the museum. I guess they don't have it on display yet because it hasn't been positively identified. There's a place called Situate Harbor, Massachusetts, south of Boston. <clears throat> I went there and interviewed folks who saw the Situate Harbor monster, which washed up on the beach in 1970. The people that saw it laying there said it's a, some kind of sea monster. The people from Woods Hole Ocean Oceanographic uh, Research Area came down and said, oh, it's just a basking shark. That's always their answer. Edward Rowe Snow said, I doubt that duels will be fought on the proper name for the monster, with the experts at Woods Hole stating it's a basking shark and Dr. Hannon positively refusing to accept anything but a real sea serpent. Just south of San Francisco is a bay called Monterey Bay, California. In 1925, this animal washed up on the beach. Now people had reported that there's an animal that lives off the coast out there with a long neck, swims around with its head out of the water like a periscope. It had been reported for years. They called it the old man of the sea. That was their nickname for it. Well, one sailor, or one fisherman, saw a bunch of seals go out and attack this thing one day, and apparently they killed it because the next day it washed up on the beach. There's the head. The guy behind it has a rifle, just in case it moves again. These pictures are in a book called uh, Calif Miss Shipwrecks and Sea Monsters of California's Central Coast. You can get the book through our ministry. It's got the best pictures I know of this California sea monster. The neck is 20 feet long. I got a letter from an atheist one time. He said, Hovind, you're so stupid. Don't you know that was a whale? Would you please show me any neck on a whale? <laughs> a 20 foot long neck. Yeah, you can see the resemblance right there, can't you? The, Mr. Wallace of the uh, Natural History Society in British Columbia, he was the president, he said, my examination of the monster was quite thorough. It had no teeth, the head is large, the neck 20 feet long. I would call it a type of plesiosaurus. Hmm. In the 1930s and 40s, more of these creatures were seen there in Monterey. Apparently if, one, there's, if there's one, there's going to be more. And the sardine fishing fleet reported seeing these creatures. One crew with 12 men said it surfaced next to their boat. They stared at the crew with large baleful eyes from a rounded head that topped a long slender neck that stuck out of the water a distance of eight or more feet. Now look at the head on this creature. It looks like a light bulb. Big round spot and then a beak, okay? Remember that bulb-shaped structure. We'll see that again in a minute. This book is called Mysterious Sea Monsters of California Central Coast. You can get it through our ministry. According to Lauren Coleman, who collects information on these creatures, <clears throat> he said in 1969, uh, in New York, in the Bronx, New York, fishermen nearly dropped their casting rods when they spotted a creature much bigger than a whale swimming by, uh, swimming upriver by one of the world's largest cities. The harbor police chased it. Couldn't catch it. This uh, is a skeleton of a basilosaurus or a zooglodon. There could be some of those still alive, at least there were 30 years ago. In Newport, Arkansas, there's a river that goes through there, a huge river called the White River. I've been there hundreds of times. My in-laws live not far from there. In 1972, the White River monster was seen. This picture on the right, you can see the creature's body, and then all the way down toward the left is the tail, apparently sticking out of the water with bumps down the back. I talked to the man who took the picture. His name is Clois Warren, last heard of in uh, it's just south of Houston, Texas. I said, Clois, what did you see? He said, I don't know, but it was 30 feet long. He said, I've been fishing out there for years, and people always laugh at fishermen, you know, claiming they exaggerate stuff. He said, I got a whole bunch of good pictures of the thing one time. I took them to the newspaper and said, here, I didn't even open the camera. You guys take the film out yourself to show we're not lying, and you develop it, and you will see the pictures of this White River monster. Well, somebody at the newspaper didn't realize it's color film, and they developed it with black and white developer and ruined the whole film. So Cloyce said, I don't know if I can get pictures like that again, but I'll try. And he came back with this picture. He said, look, that's the best I can do. He said, there's something out there. Now, it hasn't been seen since 72 because they had a big flood and a lot of the river filled in with silt. 
in that region where it was seen. So it either moved on or died or something, okay? But in 1973, the Arkansas Senate passed a resolution to protect the White River Monster. <clears throat> they said it is unlawful to kill, trample, or harm the White River Monster while it's in its native retreat. Oh, down in Jupiter, Florida, just near Miami there, this fellow wrote me a letter and said, Dr. Hovind, during the early 50s, I was flying you know, off the coast of Jupiter, Florida. I was seven or eight miles out over the Gulf Stream. The water was glass calm. Suddenly, I saw an animal. Its head came out of the water and its eyes stayed trained, trained on me as I made another pass. It appeared to be 30 plus feet long. Having seen the creature taken by the Japanese fishing boat and later the drawing in the National Enquirer, I would say this is the same creature. I did not tell anyone for fear they would think I was nuts. I was working for Pratt & Whitney Aircraft Company with high security. Later my brother and I caught a pygmy sperm whale for the Miami Sea Aquarium. I hope this will further support your belief. Lots of folks claim they've seen them in the Atlantic Ocean. There's a lake between New York and Vermont called Lake Champlain. Lake Champlain is a gigantic lake. It's the largest lake in America outside of the Great Lakes. Many folks claim they've seen Champ, the Lake Champlain monster. This book is now out of print. Um, hopefully that'll come back into print also, but it's about Champ. I interviewed Sandy Mancy, the lady that took this photograph. <clears throat> I said, Sandy, do you think you saw a dinosaur? She said, no, I know I saw a dinosaur. She and her husband and two kids watched it for 10 minutes. I interviewed Sandy. We're going to have a whole separate videotape just of all the interviews I've done. I think I've interviewed 80 people now who've seen one of these creatures. And we'll put as many of those as we can on the tape, and you can get that to see all the dinosaurs, the interviews of folks who claim they've seen them. They all describe the same thing with a long neck and a small head. Similar description. In 1998 in Discover Magazine, <clears throat> this article says in uh, Lake Champlain, 58 passengers aboard the Ethan Allen reported that a creature 30 to 35 feet long with three to five humps cruised with the boat about 200 feet off the port side for five minutes. Don't tell me it was a carp or a sturgeon, the skipper said. If it was a fish, it weighed 3,000 or 5,000 pounds. You know, the Bible talks about dragons in the sea. Interesting. He shall slay the dragon that is in the sea in Isaiah 27. Let's see, right here in Pensacola, Florida. We're right now in Gulf Breeze. You guys know where the water is around here, don't you? Wait till you see this story. In 1962, <clears throat> five teenagers went scuba diving off in Pensacola Harbor. They went off the south of the uh, Naval Air Museum. There's a sunken ship out there. It's the Massachusetts. Sank years ago. They used it for target practice or something. I forget what. Part of the ship sticks out of the water. The rest of it's underneath, stuck in the mud. And people go scuba diving. Have any of you ever been scuba diving on the Massachusetts? There you go, several of you have, okay. Edward Brian McCleary drew this sketch of the animal they saw when they were out there scuba diving. Here's the story. By the way, Edward, of these five teenagers that went out, was the only survivor. Here's the story, just like he told it. He said, we were in an Air Force rescue raft bound for a sunken ship a few miles off the coast. Midway out, we were caught in a storm and dragged out to sea. When the storm cleared, we were in a dense fog. We began to hear strange noises, rather like the splashing of a porpoise. Also a sickening odor like dead fish. The noise got closer to the raft, and it was then we heard a loud hissing sound. Out in the fog, we saw what looked like a long pole, about 10 feet high, sticking straight up out of the water. On top was a bulb-like structure. <clears throat> there it is, the light bulb, okay? It bent in the middle and went under. It appeared several more times, getting closer to the raft. The silence was broken once again by something out of the fog. I can only describe it as a high-pitched whine. We panicked. All five of us put on our fins and went into the water. Keep together and try for the ship, I yelled. After we were in the water, we became split up in the fog. From behind, I could hear the screams of my comrades one by one. I got a closer look at the thing just before my last friend went under. The neck was about 12 feet long brownish green and smooth looking. The head was like a sea turtle, except more elongated with teeth, but he wasn't positive about the teeth. There appeared to be what looked like a dorsal fin when it dove under for the last time. As best I'm able to recall, the eyes were green with oval pupils. His four friends got eaten by it. He said, I finally made it to the ship, the top of which protruded from the water and stayed there for most of the night. Early that morning, I swam to shore and was found by the rescue unit. 
I found Edward Brian McCleary in Jacksonville, Florida. I called him up. He refuses to talk about it. He handed the phone to his wife. She said, Mr. Hovind, my husband's never told me the story. She said, all I know is something really bad happened back in the early 60s, and he became a drug addict and an alcoholic trying to drown it out of his memory. And right now he's a recovering alcoholic and he doesn't want to talk about it. So that's where the story stops. But I was preaching in uh, nice, or Fort Walton Beach down the road here. A lady came to me after the service. She said, Mr. Hovind, my name is Val Bill. My stepson, Larry Bill, was one of the kids who was eaten. She said, the story you are telling is exactly correct. Panama City is an interesting spot also down the road here about 100 miles. The youth director, Ray Angerman, reported that he and his youth group <clears throat> were going across the bridge into Panama City and the whole group of kids saw this creature. He looked at the, he's looking through my books on the table. He said, that's what we saw right there. He said, we didn't tell anybody. They're going to think you're crazy. But a lot of folks are still reporting these animals still alive. Hmm. You know there could be some pterodactyls still alive. There have been quite a few reports of pterodactyls. Now there are three different, they're, they're normally listed in books of dinosaurs, and I know it's not a dinosaur, but normally they put them in there anyway. Flying reptile. There's the pterodactyl, the quetzalcoatl, and the rampharynchus. Minor differences. One has a bump on the head, one doesn't. But let me just show you about the pterodactyl, or the rampharynchus, whichever it is. In Africa they call it the kangamato, the flying dragon. In Kenya they call it batamzinga, that's their name for it. Steve Ramondi <coughs> was a Kenyan uh, student in, studying in Louisiana. He was on the Kenya Olympic running team. He called me after watching my videotape. He said, Dr. Hovind, I'm a student here at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. He said, I was watching your videotape and you mentioned there are some pterodactyls still alive. He said, we have them in my village where I'm from in Kenya, Africa. He said, <coughs> Everybody, nobody likes them because their favorite food to eat is decaying human flesh. So if you bury somebody, you better bury them deep or Kangamato will come dig them up and eat them. Kind of a carnivorous, you know, scavenger. Hmm. Frank Mellon, the African explorer, kept hearing about uh, the rumors about the much feared Kangamato, said to live in the Jaundu swamps northwest of Rhodesia, near the frontier of the Belgian Congo. He asked what it was. The natives told him it was a bird, but not exactly a bird, more like a lizard with wings of skin like a bat. When he showed them pictures of the pterodactyl and other animals, all immediately plumped for the pterodactyl, excitedly muttering, Kangamato. A couple of cowboys shot one in Arizona back in 1882. This article appeared, 1890, Tombstone Epitaph, I don't know which date it was, but somewhere in there. They said the cowboy should, said this thing they shot had a mouthful of teeth, huge wings of smooth, tough membrane like a bat, and a long, slender body. A missionary came to me one time when I was preaching and said, Brother Hovind, I've been a missionary in South America for many years. He said, the natives that we work with are scared stiff of this giant bat. And we thought they're just, you know, making up a story. But he said, it all makes sense now. Here's the story he told me. Adam Hutchins is his name. Hutchison, there's his uh, email. A-C-H-U-T-C-H at Juno.com. He and Clint Vernoy were missionaries there. This giant bat was said to capsize canoes and carry off Indians. In November of 98, I talked to Adam. He told me the Indians were terrified of this great bat, and they had sent their bravest men to the head of the river, where they killed one of the creatures about 30 years ago and buried it near the Mawada River. When Clint showed the Indians a picture of a pterodactyl, their eyes got big as saucers, and they said, that is the bat. They positively identified this extinct dinosaur as the bat that lived just a few miles from their village. Even today, the Indians will not drink or fish from the river for fear of this creature. Missionary Tyson Hughes told William Gibbons, he's the friend that wrote the book with me, Claws, Jaws, and Dinosaurs, that in Saram, Indonesia, the local people tell about a four and a half foot tall creature that has leathery wings like a bat. They call it orang batai, man with wings, like orang atang means uh, I think red-haired man or something. One missionary told me that uh, <clears throat> his best friend was out there fishing, spear fishing underwater, and his wife is up in the canoe holding the flashlight. They're doing this at night, spear fishing. And a creature came and hovered over the top of the canoe or the boat she was in. And it was glowing in the dark, a little bit slight glow to it. Now people have argued what, what would make it glow in the dark. If the animal lives in a cave during the daytime and hangs there, like a bat does, bioluminescent creatures can, can get into its fur. That's 
so far the best theory I've heard, that something is living on the creature that is dripping off as it flies around. The natives call it the ropen. Mr. Jerry Williams has been a missionary there for 28 years. He said, boy, you're right. I hear these stories all the time about this creature like a, a pterodactyl. Up and down the west coast of America, the pioneers came across rumors of the Thunderbird. <coughs> there. The Sioux Indians kept reporting this creature called the Thunderbird. They said they saw one get hit by lightning and fall to the ground. When they found the creature three or four days later, the buzzards had picked it clean to the bones, but it had a bony crest on the back of its head and a 20-foot wingspan. Here's an Indian prayer stick in a museum in Colorado. Notice the head of the pterodactyl. That's the Thunderbird legend. Now Henry Ford put an eagle on the taillight of his Thunderbird. It should have been a pterodactyl, Henry. You blew that one, okay? When Marquette and Joliet came down the Mississippi River in 1675, they stopped where today is the town of St. Louis. And they saw this big, ugly bird painted on the cliff in Alton, Illinois, right across the river from St. Louis. They asked the Indians what it was. They said, oh, it was a giant bird. They used to swoop down and pick up Indians and kill them. But a great chief called, uh, whatever his name is there, Oataga, had, used a, had killed it using a plan the Great Spirit gave him. The Indians had this thing painted on the cliff of the Piasaw bird. Well, the Indians moved out involuntarily. That's another long story. But the white people moved in, and the painting faded away. Many, many years later, somebody decided, hey, let's put that painting back on the cliff. By then, all they had was a verbal description. So just simply based on a verbal description, they put that picture up there on the cliff. They finally put a metal plaque up there, a huge metal plaque. There's me down below it for scale. But then they got afraid that huge metal thing's going to fall on somebody. And so they took it down in 96. But I went to Alton, Illinois, and got the phone book and looked up Piasaw. There are 25 listings today about the Piasaw. There's an awful lot of legends about that thing over there. Okay, people say, Brother Hovind, why on earth do you spend your time going around the world talking about dinosaurs? Well, if you think I leave my gorgeous wife because I like being gone, <laughs> you're mistaken. Okay, I'd much rather be home like everybody else. But folks, there's a war going on. I mean, somebody's got to go warn the troops. The British are coming, okay? To arms, to arms. One reason I go around teaching about dinosaurs is because Satan is using them to spread the gospel of evolution. What better way to reach five-year-old kids with evolution than to start them with dinosaurs? Because kids love dinosaurs. Secondly, most Christians are confused about the topic. The topic of dinosaurs has caused many Christians to compromise the clear teaching of the Bible. The Bible says nothing died till Adam sinned, doesn't it? So when did dinosaurs live? Don't say it's millions of years ago or you've got to compromise with the Bible. The Bible says nothing died till Adam sinned. Hmm. Plus, dinosaurs are a great evangelistic tool. And if God made them, God ought to get the glory for what he made. Remember, he's the chief of the ways of God. Well, then God ought to get the glory for the dinosaurs, and Christians ought to quit letting the devil use them to spread evolution in our own school system that we're paying for. Well, in Job chapter 41, there's another animal called Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon. In Job chapter 40, it talks about behemoth, which I believe is probably the brachiosaur. Then in Job 41, it talks about Leviathan. Two dinosaurs mentioned there. And I think God showed Job these dinosaurs so Job would get a different... Uh, attitude of who God was. So we got a problem, folks. We don't fully understand who we're talking to when we say, our Heavenly Father, you know who you're talking to? This is the God of the universe, <laughs> the God that made everything. And we expect Him to come like a puppy dog when we call, don't we? Folks, God's Word is true from the beginning. We have nothing to fear. I like science. There's no conflict between science and the Bible. There's a conflict between evolution and the Bible, oh, no question. But that's because evolution is not part of science. We'll cover lots more on that uh, in video number four about lies in the textbooks. There is no evidence for evolution. It is amazing though, how many things are covered in these books that are not true, proven wrong years ago. We'll cover all that uh, in video number four, but textbooks always say dinosaurs lived millions of years ago, and that's just simply not true. Satan is using God's creatures to turn people away from God. 
When you read Job chapter 42, Job is a changed man. We won't take time to read all of chapter 42, obviously, but Job answered the Lord, finally. Remember, God asked him 84 questions. Job's finally going to answer. And Job said, I know that thou canst do everything. Hey, did you know God can do everything? Well, then uh, why do you worry? Hmm? Somebody said, hey, why pray when you can worry? God can do everything, and no thought can be withholden from thee. He knows what you're thinking. Job said, Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not. He's saying, God, I never should have said a word. I'm sorry. Just, I should have kept quiet. Job said, Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. See, Job is getting a whole new appreciation of who God is. And he repented in dust and ashes, the Bible says. Hey, question tonight. How big is your God? Hmm? Do you ever think about that? How big is your God? Is your God big enough to tell you what kind of clothes to wear? The hmm? Bible says, uh, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Now, I know full well what city I'm in, and I know how far we are from the beach. But just because there's some water and some sand doesn't mean you can get down to less than you got for, on for underwear and run around in front of everybody, okay? Dress modestly. My daddy always said, if you're not in business, don't advertise. <laughs> hey, does God tell you how to cut your hair? Mm hmm. 1 Corinthians 11:14 14 says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. I remember when I first got saved, I was 16 years old. Man, I was a lifeguard. You know, I was long blonde hair, nice suntan. I read that verse and I said, wow, I didn't know that. I went and got a haircut. Is your God big enough to tell you what to do? Hey, if he's the boss, you just do what he says. It doesn't matter, okay? Hey, what about your speech? Does God control your speech? The Bible says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Hey, uh, when you're with all the fellows at the job or in the locker room, uh, what's your speech like, huh? The Bible says, every idle word men shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Hmm. Hey, does God tell you what to watch on TV? The Bible says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes, Psalm 101. Do you put wicked things in front of your eyes? What if you made a rule around your house that any time you heard a cuss word on TV, you shut it off for two hours? Anytime you saw somebody immodestly dressed, you know, Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders, you shut it off for two hours. Anytime you saw somebody drinking alcoholic beverages, since the Bible says, look not thou upon the wine when it's fermented, uh, you shut it off for two hours. How much would you get to watch? None. Does your God tell you what kind of music to listen to? The Bible says, speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Is the music you listen to spiritual? Now look, I like the, the style of lots of different kinds of music. I like country music. I have nothing against the style and the guitars. It's perfectly fine. But when, there's, when the songs are about adultery and fornication, it's wicked. Shut it off. Don't listen to it. The Bible says, speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. My brother and I were building my dad's office building up in Illinois, in Groveland, Illinois. And my brother was listening to this rock and roll station in the area, in Peoria there. And they came on with some kind of song. This was, I don't know, 20 years ago. And they were using God's name in vain. I went over, pulled the plug. I said, did you hear what they just said? He said, yeah, I did. I'm going to go call them. He went and called the radio station. He said, I want you to know I object to that song you just played. And they said, if you don't like it, change the channel. Click and hung up on him. Hey, does your music glorify God? If you don't know, write out the lyrics to your favorite songs and send them to me, and I will show you. Hmm? Here we got kids being taught that prehistoric animals lived millions of years ago. Folks, that's going to destroy their faith. Plus, that's calling Jesus a liar. He said the creation of Adam was the beginning. Dinosaurs lived with man all along. So people ask me, they say, Brother Hovind, did God call you to do this? I don't know. Preacher, I've been saved 32 years. I never did get a letter or a phone call from heaven telling me what to do. It just needs to be done. Look, if I tell my kids, clean your room, I don't want to come back an hour later and find them playing and the job not done. 
And they'll say, well, you didn't say make the bed. Okay, kid, listen, if I say clean the room, I expect you to figure out the details, right? Now, kids, you might as well go to sleep. You will not understand anything I'm about to say. Parents, you will understand. You know how mom can wash the clothes, dry them, fold them, and set them by the bedroom door. The kid comes in and doesn't even see them. How many know what I'm talking about? Now, come on. <laughs> Didn't you see those clothes? Uh-oh. -uh. <laughs> hey, son, would you please mow the grass? We can't find the car. <laughs> sure, Dad, sure, sure, be glad to. Son, didn't you see the grass needed mowed? Uh-oh. -uh. <laughs> Just don't see what needs to be done. I think God up in heaven is looking down at some of his kids saying, don't you see something that needs to be done? Can't you find something to do? Do you have to be told everything? Start a ministry. Go, start a new Sunday school class for left-handed, one-eyed people or something. You know, do something, okay? <laughs> Get you a bunch of dinosaurs and go grab a bunch of kids down the street. Hey, kids, let me tell you about dinosaurs. Start a ministry. Don't wait for God to call you. He already called us. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Have you done that yet? Well, if you ain't done, keep going, okay? <laughs> he already gave the orders. Now you figure out the details. Just get the job done somehow. If that means build a nice big building and bring all the folks in here, that's fine. If that means give money to a missionary to go across the ocean, that's fine. I don't think God cares how we do it. He just wants it done, that's all. See, in the book of Acts, there are two great sermons. In Acts chapter 2, Peter preached on Pentecost, and he quoted scripture after scripture after scripture. He kept referring back to things that the prophets had said. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. This was spoken by the prophet Joel. This was uh, for David ascended himself. I mean, he kept referring back. He quoted lots of verses. These people are familiar with Scripture. He's talking to Jews. And you reach them by what, they're, what you can reach them with. But when you get to Acts chapter 17, Paul's preaching on Mars Hill. These people didn't know the Scriptures. They never heard of them, and they didn't believe them anyway. So Paul never quoted one Scripture in the whole sermon. All Paul did was say, I want to talk to you about the unknown God. You guys worship him ignorantly. He said, God that made the world. He starts with creation. That's where you have to start with heathen folks. Now, folks, I don't know if America ever was a Christian country, but it's not now. And if we're going to reach this country and reach this world, we have to start with creation. It's a great way to evangelize. Some of you could get some videotapes and see how many people you can get to watch them. People will sit home and watch a video that you will never get to come to church. Especially men. If they are sitting at home holding the remote. There's this feeling of power that comes over them. How many know what I'm talking about now? There's no word for it yet in the English language, but you know what I'm talking about, don't you? People will sit home and watch a video that you never would have got them to come to church, and you can get them saved. And my material is not copyrighted. Make all the copies you want. Pass out some videos on your school campus. Hmm? Put some in your public library. Put some in your public school library. Do something. Our whole 15-hour seminar is 99 bucks, uh, or we've got a series of debates you can get on uh, me on other debating uh, professors who believe in evolution. And we've got other topical tapes. They're all out there on the table, or you can get them from our website, drdino.com. What you can do is have a dino night here at the church. Bring all the neighborhood kids in and teach them the truth about dinosaurs. Have a vacation Bible school for one night. I'll help you do that if you want. You could get a truck or a trailer or a tent and go to parks or malls or go to the beach and set up your tent. One guy in North Alabama has a tent. He'll loan it to you. Call him up, Chuck Holcomb there. He's over right now in Congo looking to try to catch Mokele and Bembe. He came to my seminar. He got so excited he built this big tent, cost him 4,000 bucks. He blows it up with a fan takes it to neighborhoods, they blow this thing up and bring all kinds of kids in there and teach them about creation. They've had hundreds saved. You can use dinosaurs as an evangelistic tool. One guy in Australia got a bus. He travels around and stops in little villages and talks about creation with his bus. You can get some puppets or flannel graph. Man, use your head. Build dinosaur adventure land at your place. We've got, they're over there in Pensacola. You can bring a group of kids over. How many have been over there and swing on my swings and stuff at Dinosaur Adventure Land? Man, we have a blast over there. And we teach the kids about creation and teach them about dinosaurs. 
And we've got all kinds of activities for them. Anybody could do that. Every church ought to have a dinosaur adventure land in, in their back 40. We bring kids in, show them movies about dinosaurs. We've had over 300 kids saved right there in our back porch with Dinosaur Adventure Land. Some of you could do that. Um, you could think of some way to reach the kids in your area because the devil is going to reach them. They're going to believe in evolution if you're not careful. We've got to do something to reach the folks in our neighborhood. Call my office. We've got a videotape and an audio tape and a series of... We'll help you get a ministry started. You could write some books or some plays about creation. Tell a radio or TV show to have a creationist on as a guest. Art Bell has had me on three times or four times now. We've got counting website and phone calls and everything else, probably around 100,000 contacts from that Art Bell show. You could give some creation material as presents, birthday presents, Christmas presents. I mean, give them something that will last a lifetime. Change their life. We've got a course we offer. It's my same seminar, slowed way down with lots more detail. Creation Science 101, Creation Science 102, Creation Science 103. Teach a course at your church some Monday night or have it at your house. Bring the neighbors in. You can get college credit for it. You could uh, get some creation tapes and put them on your cable TV. What we really need is a Christian Barney. You don't need to be too smart for this job. Get a, get a big purple suit on and get a bunch of kids together. Okay, boys and girls. <laughs> We're going to sing now. Are you ready? God loves you. God loves me. He wants you in his family. If you'll ask him now, he'll come into your heart. And of his family, you'll be part. Huh? Shouldn't they learn that instead? Yeah. I don't know why Christians have been so afraid of dinosaurs for so long. But we don't need to be. They're God's creatures. Use them for his glory. You know, it takes... 454 ground support personnel to keep one F-15 in the air for one hour. Now, during wartime, if you're not going to fly the plane, at least support the pilot, okay? Now, if you're not going to preach in the pulpit, at least support the pastor of the church, okay? And if you're not going to go to the mission field, at least support the missionary who will. Don't you think if you left your country and went to a strange land and had a strange diet, strange clothes, strange language, You'd want to get a letter from home once in a while with a $50 bill in it. And I don't mean your electric bill. I mean <laughs> one he can spend, okay? <laughs> Folks, there's a war going on. Find something to do. Our job is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Figure out a way to do it. That's why I use dinosaurs. I think God ought to get the glory for what he made. Let's all stand, bow our heads and close our eyes, and let's pray.